Coming up, the UK has the highest inflation in the G7 in 2023 and the second lowest growth rate. That's according to the latest projections this week from the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Tory Britain has always lagged behind its competitors in terms of post-COVID economic recovery, and these latest figures from the OECD confirm that this trend will continue right through to 2024. The blame can be firmly laid at the door of the UK government. The financially incompetent, high taxation, hard Brexit conservatives under Johnson the Clown, Trust the Lettuce, and now inaction man Sunak. Stay tuned. I'd really appreciate it if you'd hit the like button, subscribe, and above all, share a link to this video with your social media contacts. The OECD's latest forecast this week said average UK inflation in 2023 is set to be 7.2%, with France and Italy joint next highest at 6.1%. Strip out volatile fuel prices and other transitory elements, and UK core inflation during 2023 falls from 6.3% to 3.7%, still significantly greater than core inflation in the Eurozone, which will finish the year around 3.1%. The global think tank added that growth in the UK would be 0.3% in 2023 and 0.8% in 2024, which again puts the UK behind the Eurozone, where growth is double that of the UK in 2023 and outstrips it again in 2024. And you can also see that Germany Germany's bounce back next year will also outstrip the UK's economic growth, which we might hope will silence all those Brextremists pointing to Germany's current technical recession as signalling somehow the collapse of both Germany and the European Union. Brexit continues to be a drag anchor on the UK economy for the foreseeable future. In the intro to this video, I said that the blame can be firmly laid at the door of the UK government, and I'm just going to pick up on the OECD's recommendations for governments worldwide. Each one of these three recommended courses of action are the opposite of Sunak's government policy. One, monetary policy needs to remain restrictive, they say. To confront inflation, monetary policy should remain restrictive until there are clear signs that underlying inflationary pressures are durably abating. Our government is currently paying out £8 million a day, or £3 billion each year, housing asylum seekers because Suella Braverman has failed to clear the backlog of asylum claims being faced by an understaffed and underfunded Home Office. Rishi Sunak has shown no interest at all in clawing back £20 billion of public money lost to fraud and errors from his Covid schemes. Presumably because a lot of those billions went to Tory donors who he doesn't want to upset. For example, sterile surgical gowns were provided to the Department of Health and Social Care by a tiny company called PPE MedPro under a £122 million contract. They were never used. PPE MedPro happens to have been referred through Michael Gove's high priority lane by Tory peer Baroness Michelle Moan. And there are many more stories like this. Even the Daily Mail went after Sunak for this diabolical waste of money, with the Mail Online reporting that leading Tories labelled his approach to Covid handouts shamefully negligent. In May last year, Sunak used public funds to attempt to repair his own image, with his treasury spending £1.3 million of public money on polling and focus groups following the damaging revelations around his family's tax arrangements and the fact that he held a US green card, which can only be obtained if the holder swears that they intend to make America their permanent home. Let's hope that will be happening next year then, right after a general election. After a decade of austerity, underinvestment in British infrastructure is now biting the Tory government in the arse, with billions of pounds having to be earmarked to undo the damaging lack of maintenance of our schools, hospitals and other public buildings under successive Tory governments since 2010. The rack scandal involving unmaintained aerated concrete could yet be the final nail in the coffin for this zombie government, as it neatly encapsulates the failure of austerity. Cutting public spending to the bone during austerity years has ended up costing the country more in the long term. 
Also add into the mix the £20.5 billion spent on a Covid test and trace system under the incompetent Tory crony Dido Harding, for which a Public Accounts Committee probe later found no evidence that it had any impact whatsoever on reducing Covid infections. And let's not forget Liz Truss spending millions using a jumbo jet as her personal aircraft, flying around the world on overseas visits. Or the £900,000 spent on researching Boris Johnson's doomed dream of a bridge to Ireland. Hardly a restrictive monetary policy. How about item two? Fiscal policy needs to prepare for future spending pressures. Governments need to design and implement credible medium-term fiscal plans that recognise and respond to mounting future spending needs related to addressing ageing populations, defence, the climate transition and growing debt burdens. And yet, Sunak is under pressure from Tory backbenchers to implement voter-pleasing tax cuts before the next election. He refuses to impose proper wind full taxes on the energy companies who have fleeced the British public in the aftermath of the invasion of Ukraine. His government refuses to tax the unearned income of the wealthy at the same rates as the earned income of working people. He refuses to countenance environmental taxes on the biggest polluters. Again, the oil companies, the water companies and the meat industry. It's a myth that higher taxes mean less growth. It's one of those ideas that may seem plausible at first, especially with all the times it's repeated by Liz Truss and her Tufton Street outfits like the Institute of Fiscal Studies and the Taxpayers Alliance, but it is in fact quite wrong. Look at this graph which shows the levels of taxation and gross domestic product per capita among OECD member countries since 1970. Both GDP, which indicates the size and health of an economy, and the tax take in these countries have both increased over time. This produces a strong, positive correlation between the two, indicating that higher taxes are associated with increased prosperity rather than the opposite. Higher taxes means more can be spent on education, health, welfare and other public services. At the same time, this stimulates growth because investment in infrastructure and a healthier and more educated workforce increases productivity. By contrast, in Tory Britain, reduced spending has meant less investment and the lower productivity and growth that we're now seeing. And last but not least on the OECD shopping list, number three, lowering trade restrictions would boost productivity and growth. Now, I know I may have mentioned it once or twice in a couple of my previous videos, but we do need to talk about Brexit. The OECD state, trade integration needs to continue. It's an important source of long-term prosperity for both advanced and emerging market economies. Concerns about economic security should not prevent governments from taking advantage of opportunities to lower trade barriers, especially in service sectors. Yet the Tories' Brexit has done the exact opposite, putting in barriers to trade in the form of Brexit red tape, import and export declarations, other documentary requirements, product standards and inspection requirements. On top of this, Brexit saw the ending of freedom of movement of goods, services, people and capital, and the creation of a border in the Irish Sea. There are chronic border delays at Dover and other ports, and that's just the non-tariff barriers to trade. With the UK's departure from the EU Customs Union, tariffs or custom duties apply to movements of goods between the UK and the EU. There are differences between the EU and the UK's tariff schedules for certain commodities, and where goods attract positive duty rates, Brexit meant introducing tariffs between the UK and the EU a significant cost and competition issue for UK exporters, and the opposite of what the OECD recommend for boosted productivity and growth. On all three measures, post-Brexit Britain is flying in the face of the expert advice from the world's foremost authority on economic cooperation and development, the OECD. But of course, as we were told, the Brexit cult members have had enough of experts which really explains why we are where we are. And more about exactly where we are regarding Brexit in my next video this coming Saturday. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for a notification when that next video is published.